Since Confederation, more than 300 Canadians have served as Prime Minister of the country or Premier of their province or territory. Only 12 have been women. And of those 12 women, not a single one has managed to win a second term. Was there something about their gender that contributed to that? Let's investigate. In London, UK, we welcome Alison Redford, the 14th Premier of the province of Alberta. Back here in our studio, Kathleen Wynne, 25th Premier of Ontario and the current MPP for Don Valley West. And Kate Graham, Senior Fellow at the Think Tank Canada 2020, who's been heading up a project and podcast called No Second Chances, which describes the predicament of the 12 female First Ministers pretty well. And it's a delight to welcome Alison Redford, you to our program uh, overseas, and uh, Premier Wynne, nice to have you back here as well. Thank you very Kate, much. Kate, a repeat performance for Thanks you as for well. Thanks for having me, that's yeah. great. Not at all. Uh, Kate, just give us the background before we hear from the two uh, politicians, one former, one current. No second chances. How did this project come together? Sure. I ran as a candidate in the 2018 election in Ontario. For her. For Kathleen Wynne, <laughs> yes. And uh, it was a great experience, but I, I was quite surprised by a number of things that I heard at the door. You know, with any election, there's all kinds of issues to talk about, but I also heard comments that I would describe as uh, sexist and homophobic during like that what? race. Um, it was pretty common where I'd knock on a door and someone would say, you know, you, you seem great, but I can't support your leader. And I would say, okay, you know, tell me a bit more. And they would struggle to put their finger on what it was. And then sometimes they would say things like, you know, it's just, it's just her voice or it's just her face or things like that. And, uh, and so when the election was done, you know, some of those comments, I couldn't get them out of my mind. I was a bit surprised that's still a part of our political discourse in Canada. And so started looking into the experiences of all 12 women who have served in this role and found that, uh, sadly, this is pretty common and there are some uncanny parallels to their stories. So this project is about exploring that. Have you ever done a similar survey which would have asked whether people reacted the same way to a man? I can't vote for him, I don't like his mm -hmm. face, I don't like his voice, that kind of thing. I think, I mean, there are lots of perspectives of men and women in politics. What I cannot reconcile in my mind is that when we look at the 12 women who've served in this role, you know, they've only served for about half the length of time that men do. They tend to rise to power in pretty tough circumstances when the chances of failure are high. And when they run for re-election, they lose. And I cannot make sense of why that is in 2019 uh, when we, in a country like Canada, where we pride ourselves on, you know, diversity and equality. And so this project is about understanding, you know, what exactly happens there where we don't see women leading or succeeding as leaders the same way that we see men. Okay, let's hear from those who've had the highest job in their province. Alison Redford, to you first. Why would you want to, don't take this question the wrong way, I'm <laughs> delighted that you did participate because it's a, an important subject that we need to get to the bottom of, but why would you want to participate in this project where you are essentially, essentially reliving all of this agony all over again and in some respects putting another target on you for people to criticize what you're going to be saying? <laughs> well, that is the question, isn't it? Um, and, and, and I will tell you that when uh, Kathleen first approached me and wanted to introduce me to Kate, I think you'll remember, Kathleen, my email back was, oh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Kathleen said, well, just talk to Kate and see what her perspective is on this. And I did speak to Kate, and I'm so pleased that I'm part of this project. And the reason is that if you listen to the podcasts and you listen to the way that Kate is describing the issues and framing the questions that we should ask as Canadians. We're in some ways the center point of that, but it's not we were all great and didn't make mm -hmm. mistakes and so why did this happen to us? It's that we're human, just like male politicians are human, but for some reason it seems that we are judged differently and therefore I believe it's important for us to talk about that so that the next generation of women leaders, my daughter who's in high school now, can avoid that and we can actually try to find a way where we can truly talk about being equal. And I will say, I, I spend a lot of time right now in the UK and uh, they do a better job. Europe does a better job. We don't do a good job in Canada and I think it's time we talked about it and I'm really grateful that Kate is leading this project because uh, coming from someone who can look at this objectively, I think really lets us frame the discussion in a very interesting way and I hope it'll, it'll be a positive experience. Premier Wynne, why participate? Well, I, you know, I, um, I know about half of the women who have been premiers, and um, I knew that there would be great stories. And for me, 
uh, it's really important that our experience is used, as Alison has said, so that the next generation of women, people like Kate and uh, her generation, feel that it's worth the effort, feel that mm. they have something to contribute, and that, you know, even though we've been through what we've been through, we feel good about it. You know, we feel like we made a difference. And that's exactly what's coming through in the podcast. You I do say that at the end, that in spite of it all, you do it again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, you move the bar. You change people's lives. And because of our lived experience, because of all the research that shows that different issues are talked about, different policies are brought in when women are at the table, we're moving the bar on things that that there wouldn't be action on if we hadn't been there. Let's take a look at a map which will reflect just the past decade in Canada and show how things have changed. If you go back to 2009, there was just one part of Canada that had a female premier. And then as you see the years go on, uh, there was a point, I think, at which maybe 80% of Canadians lived in provinces and territories where the head of government was female. And of course, that brings us closer to today we can see the shading disappearing. And in 2019, there are exactly, out of 10 provinces, three territories, and one federal government, zero, zero yeah. first ministers. I want to get, if I can, Kathleen Wynne, let's get you started on this. I want to get very mathematical about this, because Alison Redford referred to this in her first answer. Both of you lost, presumably because your parties have been in power for too long in some cases. Uh, you made bad decisions in some cases. The other guy ran a better campaign in some cases. What percentage of your defeat would you attribute to the fact that you are female? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, well, I, so let me just go back to the beginning of your question, because there are all sorts of reasons. And as we hear in the podcast, um, you know, women come in at, at perilous times for the party, which I would say I did. Yes, you did. You know? Um, but there are women who follow popular, pre popular male premiers, and the party's doing well, and still weren't able to deliver that next, uh, that next, uh, re that re-election. So, uh, another point I want to make is that during my time as premier, I never would have had this conversation. I never would have talked yeah. about gender because, and I can hear Allison saying, "Yeah," <laughs> because. If we had mentioned this as an issue, there would have been a hue and cry about playing the gender card, you know? Playing I'd say you were the... whining. Exactly, exactly. So I think it's important that we look at it. I, say, I would say it's a small percentage, Steve. I, I don't know, but I also don't know whether that influence of gender is growing. I think there's a new permission because of what's happening in the United States, because of sort of right-wing populism, new permission for misogyny. That's what I'm worried about. And I think it's even more important today than maybe it was 10 years ago to have this discussion about what is it that goes on and name the degree to which gender might play a role. Premier Redford, can you take a or hazard a guess as to what percentage of your defeat would have been because of your gender as opposed to your party had been in power for almost four decades. Maybe the campaign didn't go very well. Maybe there were controversies you couldn't overcome, et cetera. Yeah. I, I think that, I mean, it's hard to put a number on it, but I, I would say Kathleen is right that um, there are all of those other factors. At the end of the day, uh, I think Kate will probably frame this better than I can, but one of the things we found in our conversations is that very often the experiences that we have as women when men have those same experiences, they're not judged as harshly for them. And so for me, that's more the, the yeah. qualitative factor around, around uh, what happens to women who are in politics. It's almost as if the bar is so much higher because we are expected to be better at a number of things. And, and therefore, when something doesn't go well, for whatever reason that might be, uh, the fall is quick. Whereas with men, it's sort of as if, well, you know, we didn't really expect much. We didn't really expect mm. that. And, and therefore, well, you know, well, and, and, you know, there are, we won't get into anecdotal stuff, but in the last two years, there's been all kinds of stuff around this. And it's like, okay, well, we'll shrug our shoulders and the men will carry on. But boy, you know, she told mm. us she was going to be different mm. and she wasn't. So, so that that expectation issue, and then I, I have to talk about likability a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah. I mean, sorry, it makes me laugh because I think I've told you this, Steve. You know, in the last 
year and a half of my term as premier, every single scrum that I had with the media, I was asked repeatedly about my likability numbers. And, and I was asked in this way, <laughs> what does it feel like to be the least liked premier in Canada? Like, great. It feels, feels great. Terrific. I love it. Like, I never knew, what is it that you want me to say? And I, and I, I think, think- I did that to you too, yeah. in this studio. Yeah. The fact is that those 300 plus men we're not asked that question over and over and over again. There were lots of men who've been re-elected who nobody liked, apparently, but they felt that they were competent and smart and strong. And one of the things that was said to me by my team as we went through is, you know, people know you're smart, they know you can make a decision, but they just don't like you. We gotta figure that out. Well, what the hell? You know, how do I do that? Anyway. I, okay, but Kate, help me out with this. These two women both won elections. They both won majority governments. Mm -hmm. So at some point, the elector took a look at them and said, actually, we like them well enough. We think they're smart enough. Uh, we're prepared to hand them the levers of power. And you're saying over the next four years, everything changed, everything disappeared? So we, I think it's a very good news story that we as the, as Canadians, as the electorate, we don't have a problem electing women. And this is true. When we see men and women run, they win in even proportion. You know, we do see women winning that first election. We don't see women winning the second election. So the question here is what happens between there? And, and as was mentioned, you know, um, most times when, you know, the first woman or the first gay premier comes through, the world, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of fanfare, a lot of, you know, we're seeing a system change. It's new. It's new. Uh, but the rapid decline, as Alison mentioned, uh, is very swift and I think it does come down to those expectations you know we are we are socialized very early in life to see men and women in different roles and we value things in women that we don't expect in men and so you know the talk about likeness I think is really relevant here Christy Clark described it as for men you can be likable and tough those two things go together for women it's a spectrum you're one or the other <laughs> and so in the project you know we pay a lot of attention to what happened from the most popular premier in Canada you know Kathleen Wynne was referred to as the popular premier by the Toronto Star, not long later, you're, asked, you're being asked those questions. Mm -hmm. What happens? And the stories, uh, by and large, are pretty unremarkable. You know, it's kind of run-of-the-mill, tough decisions that have to be made in politics. But I think we are less comfortable seeing women make those tough decisions. Well, let me just turn the clock back here, five and a half years. I think you had just come in, Premier Wynne, to um, taking over the Liberal Party and becoming Premier of Ontario when you had a meeting at Queen's Park with Alison Redford. Mm -hmm. And can we show the picture here, Sheldon? That. Yeah. You remember that. You came to Queen's Park, you had a meeting, and look at the two of you high-fiving. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this was, this was a million yeah. miles away from the days of Peter Lougheed and Bill Davis, or Ralph Klein and Mike Harris. You two, as the leaders of the two biggest economies in the country, demonstrating clearly a, uh, a friendliness and a, you know, happy to be with you kind of um, image, that, um, that was very helpful to your brand at the time. What happened there? What happened? Well, I mean, our, our relationship stayed very strong. <laughs> so. I, guess, I guess what I'm getting at is you, you, the media almost delighted, I think it's fair to say, in yes. that moment. This was new, it was different, it was kind of cool. It was to have a these... novelty. Yes, it was a it novelty. Was a novelty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it's what Kate was talking about, and that's a good word, Allison. It, it was it was new, it was fresh. People hadn't seen it before, and I think that contributes to oh well, this is all going to be different now. Everything that was before is going to be different, and the fact is, we're still operating in the same structure. It's the mm -hmm. same political system. We've got the same intractable issues that the guy before us had, you know? And so we have to deal with a lot of the same tough decisions. So, so I think that that is a disconnect for people. They think, oh, well, mm -hmm. there's this newness, so it's all gonna change. And then when it doesn't, disappointment sets in. And then there's the added piece of, I think women wear badly for the population because people aren't used to seeing women in leadership, you know? It's like so that when the novelty wears off, it's like, oh, well, this isn't what it's supposed to feel like. This person doesn't look like the leader who I have been used to for my whole life. And I think there's an element of that as well, which is where the voice well, and the face come in, right? Premier yeah, Redford, and I, and I think I, I think there's another element to that, Kathleen, which is, wait, hang on, this this premier, she's standing up there saying things that are tough and she's not smiling. And, <laughs> you know, when she when when we elected her, we wanted someone who was pretty and happy and a good mom and a good partner and all of these things that we sort of ide idealize 
women to be or or to be feminine characteristics and heaven forbid you know we stand up and say we've got to balance the budget or if in order to balance the budget we have to raise taxes or whatever the issue yeah. might be and it's and there's that the other thing i wanted to raise and kate and you and i haven't talked about this but we've talked about the film is you know kathleen and i had a very uh, collegial relationship throughout the time that we were both premiers in our <laughs> provinces um, i had also a collegial relationship with someone else and everyone will be surprised when i say this but that was with the premier of BC, with Christy Clark. I mean, I think mm -hmm. she's an incredible woman. I think she's a fantastic politician. She's a great communicator. Unfortunately, we happen to be premiers of two provinces who were diametrically opposed on particular issues, some around energy pipeline, that sort of thing. And it was because of the fact that we had to be premiers in our provinces and represent our province's interests. What I found really interesting is that when we, as women, stood up and disagreed, that was also a novelty. And mm -hmm. the press treated it in a very strange way. And, and, and I come to this because there's been a lot of research done on this, and Kate can probably speak to this more. You know, there's this element, and it's part of this films like Misrepresentation, where there's almost this novelty of, oh my goodness, the women are gonna have a cat fight. Yeah. And this is gonna be interesting to watch. And uh, mm -hmm. we don't say that about men. <laughs> So I'm sort of putting that in your lap, Kate, but it's something I've been thinking about in the last couple of days. Well, Kate, let me put it in the form of a question here. The, the, mm -hmm. the reason we know about these things is because media report on them. Mm -hmm. And half the members of the media are women. Are you saying that they're reporting as stupidly and superficially as the men are in describing these interprovincial problems as catfights? I think it, it's a much deeper and much trickier problem than that. And I think it goes back to those uh, basic gender roles where we expect men and women to be different. And when we see the novelty of someone in the role or a group of people in the role, two women that we're not used to, we pay attention to different things. Uh, and I think that includes the media, but it also includes us as citizens. You know, so we have more interest in the personal lives of women as leaders. We have more interest in talking about how they are as a mom or how they are as a partner. We have a lot more interest in what they look like and how they're presenting themselves. Uh, we feel licensed to judge the way they're interacting with others and are they being catty, are they being bossy? Things that I just, I don't think that we think about with men. We're very used to the idea of a straight white man in a senior leadership role and so we tend to treat them and talk about them in a different way than we do someone who doesn't uh, resemble the person that we've most often seen in the role. But I think, I think you've hit on an interesting question. Maybe there's another podcast or another interview <laughs> in this. I think it would be interesting to talk to female journalists and ask yeah. them what their editors <clears throat> do and what their editors ask <clears throat> them to get. Because That's an interesting it thought. may, you know, it may be a very <clears throat> different, um, maybe a very different take that they would put forward if they were left to their own devices. But in your time as Premier, did you notice a difference in the way female reporters versus male reporters treated you? Um, well, it depends. If we're talking about, we're talking about sun reporters, female reporters, was hostile, you know, if it was, well, if it was a- But that's more ideology, ideology than, But that's what I'm saying. Yeah, ideology in often informed the, hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the uh, level of attack, but I would say, I can't really, I can't really make a distinction there. But again, I'd want to know from those women mm -hmm. what they are, uh, what they're being asked to do. That's the next series. Yeah, that's the next so, podcast yes. series. <laughs> Kate, take this one on here. Um, okay, that's the situation for first ministers, be they prime ministers or premiers. Hazel McCallion, Bonnie Crombie, Charlotte Witten, those are just three female mayors that I can think of off the top of my head, all of whom got second terms. Mm -hmm. And in Hazel's case, third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh, and you know, she could have been mayor as long as she wanted to. Why does this phenomenon apparently not extend to chief executives mm. who are in municipal politics? So I would argue that we don't know that that's not necessarily true. So when you look at those were all uh, great examples of mayors, of mayors in Canada, 16%-ish are women. It's even fewer when you look at large cities. It's around 13%. We have many large cities that have never had a female mayor. Calgary is a good example. Uh, Vancouver, they just had an election. There were strong women in that race, not successful. So, you know, yes, there are examples like Hazel where she has this prolific marathon of a career, <laughs> but that is certainly not the norm. And so I, I don't know that we can conclude that this is a problem just of provincial, territorial, and federal politics. I think it's, again, it's deeper than that. It comes down to, you know, do we see women succeeding to the same level that men do in our political system at all levels? And to that question, I would still answer no. 
Okay, let's talk social media. Uh, Allison Redford, I wonder if you can tell me whether the stuff you saw on social media about yourself when you were Premier was of a different type of thing that you would have seen, in your judgment, had you been a male leader. Oh, now that's that's a very interesting question. Um, my my immediate answer is yes. Uh, you know the personal attacks, the characterization. You know carrying what I wore to the legislature on question period, um, things like that were just not things that I would expect, and nor did they comment on those with respect to men. Um, I think the other thing, um, which I might just take this in a slightly different direction, is that at the time that I was premier, which is going to sound funny now, politics was still getting used to what social media was going mm -hmm. to mean. Mm -hmm. And campaigns were starting to use it. <coughs> Uh, uh, critics were starting to use it, the press were starting to use it. And I actually think that since the time that I left politics and now, we've almost gone to such an extreme in cases like, you know, the Hillary Clinton experience during the last election, where we've sort of gone to the extreme and come back to something a little bit more central in the sense that people at least now understand the power of social media, which they didn't. I don't think when I was in politics, and this applied to something else, which is interesting in Alberta. When I was premier in Alberta, you know, we had, um, you know, as, as Kathleen did, you know, people that didn't like us who decided to make threats against us. Um, on social media, for me all the time, that was the case. But it was interesting because after I was finished as premier and when Premier Notley became premier, the security protocol changed so that those were started those were, they started to consider those to be actual security threats. So when you hear uh, people from the Premier's office when Premier Notley was Premier talking about the number of threats against the Premier, it included social media commentary, whereas when I was Premier, it didn't. And so I think the nature of social media commentary has changed, the nature of it in politics, uh, the sense that, that the peop people may maybe now understand just how destructive it can be. We've had the rise of the Me Too movement. So it's a very different time now than it was then. But back then it was horrible. I mean, my, just, just as an anecdote, one anecdote, my daughter uh, was around 12 or 13 when I left politics. And she had small groups that she would chat with online, but we, were, we would never allow her to access the full internet because of what she would see about her mother. Hmm. And, uh, and she's a smart kid. She knows what they said about her mother anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Were you on social media? Yes. Did you look at the, I mean, I know uh, you had people tweeting for you in some cases, yeah. but, but did we, you see both. what they said about you? I did. I didn't read it every day. And um, Jane, my partner, was constantly trying to tell me not to read the comments, you know, but it's a bit of a moth to the flame. You know, yeah. you want to know what those yeah. horrible things are being said. What, um, what, what were, I mean, not everybody watching this is uh, an aficionado on Twitter, so what kind of stuff would oh, get you down? I mean, there was vile homophobic stuff, just a lot of name calling and, um, I mean, just constant denigration of every aspect, what I looked like, how I, st how I spoke, everything, um, everything about me. Death threats? There were death threats. Um, and, you know, we, um, I think there were, there were a number of death threats. There were a couple that were taken very, very seriously for, for reasons that the OPP would know and, um, you know, in, increased security around me. I remember when I was going to walk in the first Pride Parade after I was um, uh, elected leader and they increased security so that I was in this tight security box, which is bizarre when you're walking in a parade because you want to be talking to everybody, but I had to stay in this very confined area. So, I, you know, the thing that bothered me the most was that there were, that my kids were mentioned sometimes in social mm -hmm. media. And um, as Allison said, those are those were the hardest things to, to deal with. And I hope that what Allison is saying is true, is that people understand what social media can do, the damage. I'm, I'm not 100% convinced that we're there yet. I think that... Maybe. Yeah, I think that we're still, unfortunately, grappling with what are the rules of civility or uncivility that we're going to accept online? And, um, and I think we, we, we have to turn to the young, younger generations who are growing up with this technology to help us grapple with that because yeah. they're on mm -hmm. it all the time. That's where they get mm -hmm. all their information. And so we need, I think, together to figure out well, how, do we, how do we 
put some rules in place. Let me play yeah. devil's advocate for a second here, though, uh, Premier Wynn. If you go on Twitter today, you will see Doug Ford, your successor, referred to as fat, as an oaf, mm -hmm. as a dolt, as a disgrace. There are numerous unpleasant things said about him on social media. Was, just so we understand, was the kind of way people hated you different from the kind of ways people apparently hate him? You know what? I, I don't think I, I don't think I can assess that. I think the, the pundits and the historians are going to have to do those comparisons. What I do know is that um, <laughs> during my time as Premier, there was a real concern among not just my team, but the, the media also. I had, I had members of the media say to me that they were really distressed by the level of vitriol on the on social media. Worst thing I ever saw. Right. So so we'll you know, we'll compare what's worse. But I would just make the general comment that it's it's not healthy. The whole mm -hmm. the whole level to which yeah. we've sunk is not healthy. We've got to deal with it. It's all bad, men yeah. or women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kate. If I could just add, there is, uh, there's a phenomenal PhD student at U of T named Erica Raymond. She'd be a, a great guest, actually, and she's studying exactly this question. And uh, interestingly, her finding was that there is a lot of negativity and vitriol towards male and female politicians uh, until you look at in leadership roles. So when women step into leadership roles, that's when you see an enormous escalation. Hmm. So based on, I think she's looked at millions of tweets mm -hmm. in a very uh, serious analytical way, the answer is yes. When women step forward in leadership roles, they are targeted more with uh, negativity, vitriol, and hate online. What is the gender of the people who are tweeting that vile stuff? That I'm assuming it's 99% male, but do we have any facts on that? That'd be that'd be a good question for Erica. I, I will ask that. We've we got to get her on yeah. and ask that. Uh, I suspect. Do you want to bet? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, w I would bet it's 99% yeah, male. Yeah, I would bet it's 99%. Yeah. Male. That would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I presume all of you uh, around this literal and metaphorical table know Libby Davies, who was a deputy leader of the federal NDP for uh, quite a chunk of time. She was in here uh, last week, and we talked to her about the different ways in which men and women lead mm -hmm. since she has worked for both female and male leaders in her time with the NDP. Here's what she had to say. Sheldon, roll it if you would, please. I think there are gendered differences in leadership, and women do bring uh, a, a style of more consensus building. It's not so hyper-partisan. There are very partisan women, and we, I mean, we're in politics. We're going to be partisan. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's a different style of leadership that isn't so ego-driven. Uh, and for me, it was always about the issues, right? It was always like working on the issues. It wasn't so much about my own ego. Or, and, I, and, I, and I feel that uh, that's the case for a lot of women in mm -hmm. politics. So here's the question that comes out of this. Alison Redford, to you first. Given that there are 0% of Canadians today who are living in provinces or territories where the first minister is a female, unlike the time when you two were in power, when uh, I think 80% of the population was living uh, in provinces with a woman leader, what's being lost by the fact that we're at zero today instead of something higher than zero? Alison Redford, to you first. I think there are two things. Kathleen uh, mentioned it earlier, and that is uh, whether we like it or not, and first ministers in Canada may deny it, we're going to talk about different issues. Yeah. Uh, we are going to talk about health care and education differently when we don't have... Uh, we're going to talk about bullying differently. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about bullying on social media differently when we don't have women at the table. Uh, I think we're going to talk about uh, fiscal policy differently. The other thing that I think we're missing uh, is there are no women now in those roles who can be role models for a younger generation. Hmm. I think that's really important. I, and, and the third thing is something that Libby said, and, and we've seen this in research, and again, Kate can give you the, the, the factual background, but the sense that women who get into politics tend to do it later in their life because of issues, whereas men often will make a decision to go into politics when they're quite young and build their career to be elected and therefore <coughs> approach the issues differently. Uh, so I don't know if that means you get a better representation on an issue or a worse, but you get a different representation. And, and I think those are things that, that uh, will make our system weaker in the long run. Premier Wynne? Well, I'm most worried about um, the, the issues that we focus on. Province by province, you know, I think that, as Allison said, the, the issues that are brought to the table by women that have to do with the children and the future and, uh, and the well-being of people who are marginalized, I think those issues 
tend to be not as uh, not as well addressed. So I'm I'm most worried about that. You know, when I was first elected leader, we had there were six women who were premiers across the the country. We came together and supported, for example, the Indigenous community on the missing and murdered Indigenous women. Maybe we would right. have done that if it had not been six women around the table, but I don't think so. I remember the conversation and I remember yeah. it was the women who were leading that conversation and we Alison, if you remember, we pulled everybody in, you know, it, it felt like yep. we were building bridges where there hadn't been bridges before. And That's so right. I fear that that will be lost. Alison Redford, just finally, you're out of politics now. What are you doing with your life? I'm uh, doing some consulting work at the World Bank around uh, climate change and energy regulation. And I'm also studying at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, at the University of London, doing my master's degree on uh, South Asian energy security um, in uh, sort of international strategy and diplomacy. Fascinating. Now, this is a question that every ex-politician gets. Can you ever imagine going back into politics? No. I loved it. It was a privilege. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how I would handle it now. I will say I wish I'd been a bit older when I went into politics. Um, but, but once you leave, I think it's good to leave. What's the life of an ex-premier like now? Because you're not out of it, obviously. No. You're still there. So I won my seat, and uh, I continue re to represent the people of Don Valley West. Um, I work in my constituency office, and, uh, and I'm at Queen's Park. Um, so the pace is different. Um, you know, I, I, it's interesting. People come and see me, and we have conversations about many of the same issues that we talked about, and, and we have to talk about them in more abstract ways, you know, because I don't have those levers of, uh, mm -hmm. of power. But, but I do also find that people come and talk to me who are trying to just figure out government. You know, they're trying to figure out who to talk to, um, what they should say, how it works. And, and those are good conversations because they, they're usually younger people or they're people who haven't worked with a, a government whose ideas they don't support. And so I, you know, I have something to contribute to that conversation and, uh, and I will continue to do that while I'm, uh, while I'm there as the MPP. I do have to ask you about one other thing, which is, I mean, I think your situation, certainly in my lifetime, your situation is unique where a defeated premier wins his or her seat and stays on. Mm -hmm. When you have got up in the legislature during question period to ask questions, you sometimes get booed <laughs> by the other side. It's sometimes. Okay. Is it all the time? <laughs> Every time. Absolutely. I'm like, I'm like a lightning rod. But you know what, Steve? What do you think of that? Well, I, I think it says more about them than it does about me. Okay. Uh, I have a job to do. And, you know, I have a lot of information about what's going on. And so the questions that I ask, whether it's about whether the Premier has met with the First Nations chiefs or whether it's about the impact of e online courses that kids we know won't complete in, in secondary school, um, like I've got a lot of questions about what this government is doing. And they don't like it when I ask questions. And that's, that's their problem, honestly. My job is to use my experience and my knowledge in the best interests of the people who I serve, and I'm gonna to continue to do that. We are happy to recommend for people's edification, No Second Chances, which yeah. is Kate Graham's podcast. Uh, I've heard every episode. There have been eight so far? Yes, okay. more to come. More to come, yeah. all right. I look forward to what remains. Great. And we thank very much Alison Redford for being there on the line for us from London, UK. She's the former Premier of Alberta, and Kathleen Wynne, the former Premier of Ontario, still the Liberal MPP for Don Valley West in the Ontario Legislature. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Take care, Allison. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, you too. Take care. Bye. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.